But Dropbox is also very simple, and it works. It works just like that, actually. It, you don't have to think about it. It simply works. And when it comes to usability and the user interface design, and of course this is uh, the, the web view, everything is super simple. And if you right-click on one of these folders to, to get an option, you're not going to be bombarded by a Microsoft Word-like option formatting panel that has a thousand different options. It's going to be very simple. And in fact, it is. And in this list, there's you know, very few items. And when I was speaking with one of the, the designers over at Dropbox, he told me that every day they're working harder to make this list even shorter. And so the intuitive uh, usability of Dropbox is, is really fascinating, and, and seeing where they're going is, is really exciting. And so that is kind of my two examples for branding, branding and software. And I think it's important to note when you're designing software that you're designing for a brand. <coughs> I work for a company called Flint. Uh, Flint works in the retail demo space. So what that means is that uh, when there is a mobile phone on display, mobile phone or tablet, whether it's in Vodafone or Best Buy or, or T-Mobile, uh, there's a demo running on this application. Now we work with the Android's Nexus line of devices, and we work with Google to do this, and we create applications that are on display in these retail environments that do one of three things. The first thing that it does is lock down the operating system. This way, uh, users don't go into settings, reset the device, and, and things like that. More importantly, users can't log into Facebook or Gmail uh, and then walk away with their information compromised. The second thing that the application does is highlight certain application, or uh, uh, like phone features, things like that, uh, different apps and, and uh, operating system features. And the third thing that the application does is, is run a screensaver. And here's an example of kind of the, the retail space uh, that we're in. Uh, and this is a, a Best Buy location. And uh, a lot of times you see phones that are on display, but when the phones are on display, um, they're not actually, uh, there's no app running, or the operating system isn't there, or the phone is off and there's a, a, a sign on the, on the device. And so we try to make the experience as, as friendly as possible. And one of the challenges that we face is that a lot of times when someone is interested in an Android device, they might not be familiar with the Android operating system. They might be an iOS user. And so what we have to do is we have to highlight certain native uh, UX elements of the phone, but at the same time allowing uh, a non-user of Android to be able to understand how it works. There was, uh, in the earlier talk, there was kind of like a, a discussion about whether the back button uh, should exit the application or whether it should bring up a toast or a notification that says press it again to close. And just a quick comment on that, um, at least for the types of things that we're working on, and, and that, was, that was great because I think the response was that uh, the user said that we'd like you know, the, the features of the, of the phone to kind of give you a warning, that way we don't accidentally close the application. And I think it was a very popular Polish application. But we call this kind of like learnability versus usability. The first time the, the user might go into the application, press the back button, and realize, oh, you know, it closed the app and I didn't mean it to do that. But then the second time when they go back into the application, they say, you know what, I pressed back right when I got into the application and it closed it out, so I know not to do that again. It may take several tries, but we like to distinguish that, at least uh, in our studio, learnability versus uh, usability. <coughs> so. There are a lot of different classifications of design. Um, and I, I just have just a few here, and this is not even an exhaustive list. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of like cross uh, between. Uh, I think that interaction design is, is a popular buzzword that uh, can be uh, put together with user interface design or, or UI design. And a lot of people often confuse UX design with UI design or graphic design with visual design. And what does it really mean? Uh, and then we have product design, and then we have product managers, and we have project managers. And so in terms of design, I tried to highlight kind of like these six categories, and I'll go through these six categories, uh, and then we'll kind of get started with how the design process works, and how to really, as a developer, focus on design 
in every step of the process. Uh, and and uh, referring back, prototyping is, is also very important and, and part of the process. So let's go ahead and get started with uh, visual design. So visual design, a lot of times you think of uh, as the final graphic assets, like what will the actual application look like? And so the, the designer, graphic designer, or visual designer creating this will be able to create the high fidelity mockups and use that to create the assets that the engineers will then use to, pl pl uh, to place in their application. It's the overall look and feel. And graphic design is very similar. Graphic design is a more generalized term um, and it encompasses the aspects of visual design, but it also extends to the reach of logo design, print design, um, and things like that. Um, visual design in many ways can be used for what graphic designers uh, are, are doing, and graphic designers can be a title used for visual designers as well. So those are interchangeable. And then we have user experience design. So I, I would say that non-technical people are familiar with graphic design and maybe familiar with visual design, uh, but once you start getting into the technical realm, then user experience design becomes something that everyone knows is important, but they don't always know how to explain what it is. So user experience design is kind of like the holistic view of, of things and incorporates visual design and UI design, interaction design, and it's really considered the entire kind of like the front end. It's the complete package. And it also extends back more as well. And it's really important to have kind of like a consistent idea of the user experience design when you're building an application from, from the start. User interface design or interaction design, uh, we saw some great examples with kind of like the UI flow uh, and the prototyping. It's really just like the screen by screen flow and how the user interacts with the buttons or if there are sounds and that beep boop beep boop sound is kind of like going in my head from the video. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's really the tools that the video is present, or not the video, but the, the application uh, presents to the user. Uh, and so that's uh, user interface design. And so consider that user interface design is in a way a subset of the user experience design. And then we have product design, which a lot of times uh, encompasses uh, user stories turned into requirements, and these requirements uh, turned into design needs. And they, you know, product designers are, are designers and they're working with the design team, they're working with visual designers, they're working with interaction designers, and they might be designers themselves or they might be more business oriented uh, and, and writing specifications and things like that. And then we have illustration. And I think illustration is, is an important uh, thing to add here because we're s starting to see, especially with mobile, how many people are making games. And I wasn't at the talk, but I, I saw a lot of uh, tweets about I think it was the keynote and how one of the big slides said, as a mobile developer, do not make games. So it's, it's definitely funny to note how many people are gravitating towards making games. But illustration is a big part of that, the visual design and the overall design of an application. So in general, the, vi the vision of designers has changed quite a bit. Uh, and so what I mean by that is that in the past, it was really the development team that was able to take something and, 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 and launch it and the idea of having designers was, was not as important. Um, and so UI design has become important to team managers and we're seeing that more because of mobile. And mobile has brought on a more obvious need for this. And we have limited real estate, we have multiple devices that are uh, different screen sizes and things like that, especially for Android. And what we're seeing is that the developer-designer relationship uh, and the developer-designer ratio is changing and balancing out. Whereas we might have seen a development team of 10 or 11 have maybe one designer or a contract designer, we're starting to see, at least in Silicon Valley, that ratio becoming closer to one to two, and in some cases, even one to one. Um, after speaking with some people at the conference here, it seems that the average for kind of like the development firms that I've been talking to are around, for every six developers, there is one designer. And it's, it's really important uh, to kind of, uh, you know, note that and also know how many designers are actually interacting with the developers on a daily basis. More importantly, it's very different when you are in the room with a developer or a designer and you reach over and you, you grab their shoulder and you say like, hey, 
like we need to do this or, or this needs to change or you know the spec doesn't highlight exactly what I was trying to get across and so it's it's really important to have very close communication between developers and designers there was a uh, quote uh, that I've been using uh, from Ron Conway and it was at startup school in uh, just a few months ago and the quote was it used to be that the algorithm was your most valuable IP, like Google. Now it's users, user design, and, and user interface IP. And what essentially this is saying is that we're starting to get so advanced in terms of the features and functionality that software developers can implement into applications that just having a feature that, uh, or a fe just having a feature or functionality might not be enough to differentiate your app from another. And the differentiator here is really the user experience design uh, and, and the design itself. And of course, users are, are uh, very important, if not the most important, uh, going back to testing, I guess. And so often, I ask uh, software developers, I say, how often do you, as a developer, interact with designers? And I think it was two weeks ago, I got a pretty funny answer. Um, I asked the developer how often he, acts, he interacts with designers, and he said, I interact with designers every day on every step of the process because I'm the product manager, I'm the developer, and I'm the designer myself. And so it was a clever answer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's focusing on design the whole way through. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of brilliant developers and designers that are kind of like you know, the complete package. Uh, but it, it always helps to, when at least a formalized software, you have a formalized software development team, to have a, a designer on staff. And increasing that ratio closer to one to one is always best. <laughs> I thought it, I thought it was a, a, pr a pretty good answer from him. <coughs> so team size is actually uh, pretty important too. What we're seeing is that with smaller teams, a lot of like for example a startup. A uh, team of three. We have a business person, we have a designer uh, or a developer, or in some cases two developers. Everyone is, is really doing everything. You know, we, a lot of times we say that in a startup you're wearing many hats. And so the developer might be you know, trying Photoshop or Illustrator, or the CEO might be trying uh, Xcode or, or downloading Android Studio for testing or whatever it may be. And so in a small team we're seeing that the communication is, is flowing pretty closely um, and Design is, is really handled by everybody, and development is, is handled by uh, whoever can help out as a primary, and then anything else that is needed comes uh, as kind of like an assistance. And so that's a small team. And then we see kind of like medium-sized teams. And so medium-sized teams of anywhere between like 6 to 12, for example, we're starting to see a more formalized process with maybe sprints or uh, a more formalized uh, task or project management software and the designers and the development team uh, does become uh, a little bit more formal and uh, everything is starting to be kind of like specced out, right? And, and we'll go into kind of like detail about uh, that process in just a second. Uh, and then you have really large teams uh, and these are teams like what we're seeing at Facebook or eBay or Google. And it seems like each of these companies, they're doing something different. Uh, Google, for example, they have a team of engineers and there are designers assigned to different groups. And so uh, within the Android team, for example, uh, there might be different engineering teams. And then there's one Android design team that reaches out to these different engineering teams on an individual uh, basis. A company like Box, they do things a little bit differently. Uh, they have engineering teams of maybe uh, five or six that work on different features and, and software. Uh, items and they have one designer uh, on each of those teams and so those designers essentially have stand up with their engineering team and then they have a design stand up with their design team so what this allows the the software uh, team to do is have a designer within every team but also have a consistent and formalized uh, design process so it's really interesting to see how small medium and large teams really work together when it comes to design. And it's becoming more important as well. So uh, design focus. So a lot of times we start with kind of like an idea. We have a concept and uh, 
whether you're a designer, a developer, or you simply just have an idea, this is the stage where you actually start writing it down. So a lot of times this drawing happens on a napkin in a restaurant somewhere when you just think of an idea. And it's, it's really important that the design process starts right here. And a lot of times it is an initial sketch or uh, initial kind of like a set of wireframes. Even if it's a non-technical person, a lot of times people think like, okay, I know what I want the app to do. I don't know how it will do it, but I know how it will look like, look like from a general sense. And one reason why we're starting to see more people are kind of like gravitating towards creating a, a mock-up, even if they're non-technical, is because they're being exposed to the software and they're users of, of iOS and Android and, and they kind of understand how the traditional trajectory of applications work. So I think it's really important to note that the design, uh, design elements start uh, at the idea. And so this is kind of like the best way to maintain focus. So a lot of times uh, after you have a general idea, then you jump into thumbnail sketches. And I, you know, we're going to go through maybe a list of kind of like five or six steps in terms of the design process, ending with kind of like a specification uh, that goes into software development. Uh, but all of these can be ordered uh, in, in any way. So a lot of times a software team that is maybe a little bit more mature might say, okay, we have this idea, let's start writing a spec for it. And then there might be smaller teams like the team of three that I mentioned that say, you know, we don't need to formalize things in a specification. We know exactly what we want to do. Let's just create the wireframes. And so it's, it's really important to know that uh, every team operates and works differently. But if the design elements and kind of like having a sense of design and uh, what we're going to go through here is at the forefront of the development stage, then it's, it's always best. And, and prototyping and testing is, is something that comes uh, along the way uh, really right after the thumbnail, uh, thumbnail sketches. So once you're off the napkin, you, you're ready to start testing. And so the thumbnail sketches in, in a way are, um, you know, drawing them out. Uh, you know, there are really cool uh, stencils and things we saw from like the earlier talk um, that you can use. And uh, it, it's part intuition and part research. And so what I mean by that is that you have an idea for an application and you have an idea of how a user will perceive the application. And you would think that, okay, if I put a button here, then they will know to click that, right? So that's part intuition. And so when you're building software, especially at these early stages, uh, such as like, you know, creating the thumbnails, it's important to know, or at least have an estimated idea of what the users can expect. And so it's part intuition, it's, it's part research. And what I mean by that is after you have kind of like those initial thumbnail sketches, you have to put them in front of a potential user and say, do you understand this flow? Or, or take them through kind of like a, a focus group and, and actually show them, you know, go through the prototype with them, the paper prototype or, or just kind of like the storyboard format of the thumbnail sketches and see if they kind of like it, it resonates with them. And so that's what I mean by part intuition, part research. Now, a lot of designers, they kind of like lean to, towards one or the other. And they might see that if they don't do any usa uh, usability testing, that after they have a somewhat complete app, that they see that, well, maybe it's not working. Maybe you only thought it worked that way, but actually users don't, don't feel the same way. And then at the same time, there are people, or there are designers that focus too closely on research and they test at every stage of the process and what they see is that they're really spinning the wheels and they're not really getting any ideas out there. And so it's really a fine balance between the two. Uh, but a lot of times at the early stages, if, if you don't, uh, if, if you work with research and you try to collect data too often, then you, you might lose uh, track and you might kind of like avoid the path that you're trying to go to. Uh, a lot of times it's not a bad thing though because you might pivot, you, you might think that you have an idea that is great, and you have this kind of like intuition that it'll go in one direction, but then you'll see actually the data is showing me that you know, this is a gold mine right here and that's gonna be a killer app. So there's pros and cons and it's really balanced, but the thumbnail sketches is a great way to quickly and cheaply start the testing process. <coughs> so after the thumbnail sketches, a lot of times we jump into creating wireframes. What we're doing is essentially creating a higher fidelity version of these thumbnail sketches. And this example I have here is kind of like highlighting uh, just a, an iOS application 
uh, or it could be an Android application that has um, you know different items you know it points to different items it talks about like scrolling views and this is just an example but essentially it just shows how how detailed uh, the application can be so it's detail oriented oriented and it's important to know that it's functionality first you don't want to focus too much on you know what colors will be used or or how big would the icon be or what should the icon look like because you essentially just want to make sure that the functionality is there so when the software development team or, or your software uh, engineer looks at it, they can say oh you know this can be done or or this can't be done or whatever it may be and it really starts with kind of like an evolution of iterations so you might have one set of wireframes that was based off of your thumbnails and then it could lead to something completely different and so it's important to kind of like you know continue the process in in a slow manner and and, and really build and iterate with everyone involved and again communication is key and a lot of times when you're working with wireframes it's operating system specific and that's just because there are different kind of like elements of Android or iOS or, uh, for example, if you're working with Windows Mobile, that really changes the way that the wireframes may look. And so it's at this point where you might branch off to kind of like different wireframes for different operating system uh, or even different uh, platforms if you're going to web as well. Uh, mobile web not being excluded. Uh, and this is essentially in, in many uh, software teams where the development starts. They see that there's a general flow, and uh, the flow can, you know, highlight certain functionality, and maybe there's a back end that, ne you know, that can be started on. And so the development really starts at this stage, even though the wireframes might not be finalized from both a visual and a functionality end. And so wireframing is very important. And so uh, testing at this stage is, is also uh, critical. And those uh, iterations that we were discussing is really important when you uh, highlight kind of like testing elements between each of those iterations. And testing should bring about new iterations and, and things like that. Uh, the next uh, item is UI flow. And again, this was not in any particular order. Uh, but what we are starting to see is that uh, the UI flow can come a lot of times before the thumbnail, after the thumbnails, uh, or even after the, the wireframes, uh, which I have uh, here. And so essentially, once you have an idea of what the general application functionality uh, is, is going to do, then you can create kind of like the overall flow and see, OK, so this is the primary focus of the application. And although we have a primary focus, we also need kind of like the different screens for you know, whether it's contact or bug reports or, or kind of like the secondary and tertiary items of the application. And that's where the UI flow comes in. This, the UI flow also gives you a chance to kind of like step back and say, OK, you know, what are we missing? Or you know, there's a gap here, or we need to take this area out completely. And so it really helps to identify uh, gaps and, and, and gives developers a sense of scale. Uh, in terms of project scope, it also helps the team identify how long the project is going to be. And so the UI flow is, is, definitely, is definitely great. And so the next, uh, the next item is the design specification. So a lot of teams choose not to create a really formal specification. Uh, and so I'll go into a little bit detail about uh, exactly what a specif uh, specification entails. So if there was one document that uh, really was kind of like the, the holy grail of your application, it would be the specification. Not only is it technical, or at least um, there are different classifications of design specifications with, with versus technical specifications. And a lot of times before there's a design specification, we have what we call a PRD, or product requirements document. And so this is essentially generated by the consumer once, for example, the user stories come and say, you know, I want the application to do this, I want to be able to see this, and I want to be able to do that. So those are translated into a list of requirements, and those requirements are then designed into an application that will be in the design specification. In the design specification, we're also starting to see kind of like um, it, it defines what the product uh, does and who it's for. And so there's a, a great, um, and essentially it's like a template that Joel Spolsky of Fog Creek Software in New York has, and he talks about how it's important to highlight every single detail that you could think of about your software in the specification. And so a lot of times the, the beginning of a specification starts with kind of, you know, like who is it for and uh, different use cases uh, in, a, in a, almost a narrative way. Uh, after kind of like the summary is built up, then you go into kind of like the wireframes, 
uh, detailing and commenting and uh, really putting the you know all the elements that we discussed maybe not necessarily the thumbnails or the the napkin sketches on there but a lot of times that fits into the specification as well uh, but you know the wireframes go in there and then the wireframes have comments and details that uh, answer all questions so if a developer is just looking at the visual vi wireframe he may not know uh, what the button does or if the if the button has animations or things like that and so all those tiny little details are highlighted in the design specification and uh, the developers primary resource after the designer uh, is essentially the design spec and so if there's anything on the design specification that the developer doesn't understand it's really important to keep those lines of communication open this also really helps uh, users or uh, not users, but the software team and the designers uh, have, you know, everyone is, make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, and a lot of times the, the, the client will also want to understand that everyone is on the same page in terms of the functionality, even though the requirements that they thought of might not have necessarily translated to having a sidebar here or an extra button here or whatever it may be. So the design specification is, is extremely important. And, uh, Along kind of like with the idea of a design specification, there was um, a, a great slide at, at Chris's talk uh, in track one this morning uh, that and he said, write code for the person after you. And this is especially important uh, when it comes to d creating a specification because you want to be able to take this document and hand it off to somebody you know, completely out of the blue in terms of the project and they should be able to hit the ground running after they look at the software or after they look at the design spec. And a lot of software teams are taking that design spec, and then what they're doing is they're creating a functional spec with uh, some of the more detailed and uh, advanced uh, technicalities of the software, and, and that's where uh, it's placed there. And so that the function, functional spec really never makes it to the client size. And so um, <coughs> the next uh, item is uh, a lot of times a client's favorite, and these are the high fidelity mockups. And so everything that in terms of the design process you are thinking of uh, ends up uh, you know into this application and right before the application is created or uh, the prototypes you know uh, the results are compiled to create this this final product we have the high fidelity mockups and so these essentially these mockups would essentially replace the wireframes in a specification so depending on where your specification is at it might have high fidelity mockups or it might have wireframes because the high fidelity mockups really translate, uh, you know, directly what you're trying to get across uh, better than than the wireframes. So it's it's really important to have those in there. And so they provide the visual design elements. And after you have the high fidelity mockups, designers often take these files, whether they're uh, Illustrator or, or Photoshop uh, files, and they they extract the assets. Uh, if there's anything that's custom, excuse me, if there's anything that's custom, like icons or even if there's colors, anything like that they're extracted and then they're given to the developers and the assets are then placed into the application. Um, and so this is really the closest non-functional representation of the software. And a lot of times the high fidelity mockups are taken and you know whether using Keynote or the different mockup uh, prototyping tools we have are then uh, prototyped to mimic that functionality. Uh, and that way the developers really get a sense of what exactly the software does and how how it works uh, and so we just have kind of like a, a general example here um, and so this is really kind of like the the last stage of of the design process when you're thinking of, of focusing on design and, and thinking about design throughout the entire software development process and so it's true that uh, software can be created without you know essentially having any of these formal steps but I feel like a lot of these steps will at least be touched upon uh, through the development process. And so having a designer present, like, you know, throughout the entire uh, path, I think is especially important. And here's just kind of like a quick list of, of everything, you know, we have here. And so it's, it's just like thrown up there, but it, it kind of goes to show that, you know, you could build an app without any of this stuff. You know, you could you know, go into uh, Xcode and start storyboarding um, or, or you can kind of you know slowly go uh, across the the path of the process, um, and maybe I shouldn't use the word slowly because uh, although this it does take longer to incorporate design in many ways, uh, at the end you'll be receiving you know you'll be a lot of times especially if testing goes right you'll be 
creating ultimately a better product. And so um, that's it for, uh, for my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I'll also be uh, outside if you guys have any questions later or uh, want to grab lunch. So thank you. Please use microphone to ask questions. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. I have uh, a couple of questions. The first being, um, how do you uh, suggest approaching creating the design spec, knowing that it will change over time? Because it, w it seems to me that what you've explained and what you described is a situation in a perfect world where both the designers and developers are happy, have a lot of time and stuff like that, and that's great. But uh, it, a lot of projects that I've seen have the design spec of some sort created initially, but then it changes bef because you know some decision, business decision uh, are being made and stuff like that, and it's never it never gets updated because we're after you know we're in the d development stage after all, so it doesn't make any sense. Then someone new comes to the project and see, sees sees uh, some kind of uh, uh, spec that's really out of date. So maybe there's a way of creating that with, uh, um, with much smaller uh, investment uh, required to keep it up to date. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, the design spec should really be a, a living document. And so if a developer is creating software that's not highlighted in the design spec, then they're really just creating it from their own intuition, it seems. And so when you have that kind of like uh, uh, unorganized type of situation, and Unfortunately, that comes up a lot because a lot of times the deadlines that we face are uh, not only unrealistic, but sometimes really in the past. So I, I understand how some uh, dev developers might say, you know, I, I can get started on this. But if the focus of the software development project is on the design spec, then if it's not in the design spec, then it shouldn't be developed. And if there's something that's blocking the developer, then that's when the discussion should be raised and the specification should be updated. And in a lot of times, uh, in, in a lot of, uh, on a lot of teams, the design spec is created in, in the beginning. But the thing is, if there is not enough content to kind of like get started, uh, then it, it, it doesn't really make sense to just have kind of like that, that base document. But it is really important. So, it, you know, depending on the size of the team, uh, it, it might be better to start in the beginning or, or maybe start once the wireframes are done. So, but yeah, I, I, I completely understand with uh, what you mean about having outdated specs and, and there's this, you know, a, a lot of times when you're working with tight deadlines and, and new people come into the project, what we see is that, you know, the, the curve of adding new people to a project doesn't necessarily increase the, the rate at which the project is being made, but after a certain point, it actually slows it down because everyone needs to get on board and it takes time to not only bring everyone on board, but explain what the software is doing to these, you know, you know eight or nine developers. And I, I think um, there's, a, there's a great book on, on that topic, and I, I can't remember what it's called, but it, it shows a, a great graph, uh, and it essentially shows that once you get to a certain point, adding developers does not increase the, the yes, the, yeah, the uh, mythical man month, which, which is kind of like, you know, and, and I think that was maybe, 20 years ago that that was written, but in many ways it still holds true. And so having, kind of having everyone on the same page is definitely important. So, any other questions? Yeah. yeah, hi, so my question is about the redesigning an existing app. Let's say we have an app which is uh, in the app store for about a year and the UI is simply out of date or maybe we have some um, many negative comments about the user experience and it, in case of redesigning the app, is the process the same as you described, or is it maybe different in a way? Yeah, um, so I would say that it depends on the data that you have. What's great about having an app that's at the out, uh, in the, in the, um, out and has users already is that you can get feedback. And you know, having negative feedback is definitely better than having no feedback at all. So if it's you know, minor changes uh, that your users are experiencing or, or uh, want to make adjustments to, then yeah, I would say that you don't need to go through the process uh, completely. You just need to just focus on that portion or that feature of the application. But if you have so many comments that the users don't really know uh, why they don't like the app, then maybe it's better to look at the data and say, 
okay, these are the features that the users have used. These are the features that the users haven't used. What can we take? What can we kind of like drop and, and create a new application with this data? Uh, and so I think, you know, you're in a really good position when you have an app out there, even if it's not doing that well, because you know what the users don't want, and that's, that's getting closer to what they do want. Uh, I have a question uh, about the order, because you, you, you put uh, defining the flow after the wireframes. Uh, well, I'm not a designer, I'm, I'm more a developer, but the process I witnessed uh, involved creating uh, usage scenarios including flow before doing wireframes like and doing this cycle kind of in the loop uh, before moving forward because then doing mockups is probably the most expensive uh, part to change again uh, so can you yeah. comment on that um, so it's definitely good to point that out um, so depending on how the design team is functionally functioning uh, it may be better to capture certain elements, and, and this is kind of like the reason why I had uh, the UI flow after the wireframes, right? It might be better to capture certain elements after you have the core functionality in place. An example would be for um, if you have an application that has one feature, right, and that feature is the core competency, uh, it doesn't make sense to highlight the entire application flow before you have the flow for that core competency. And so maybe not necessarily create the wireframe examples for every screen, but just kind of like the main flow. And so after you have that, then the rest of the UI flow comes from that. But actually, traditionally, I do create, uh, and the teams that I work with, we create the UI flow before we even go into, into the wireframes. Um, so the order is really kind of up in the air. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, if you, uh, do you deal with clients? Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you, maybe you have some tips, uh, how to deal with clients who are uh, completely disinterested with uh, watching wireframes and everything that uh, is between uh, the, the initial uh, application design and the high fidelity uh, um, like graphics and, and mockups. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's really hard to kind of try to, you know, a lot of times it's really hard to convey the message that you're trying to get across when the client doesn't really know what they want. Uh, and so what we do is we create uh, kind of like that product requirement document and we hand it over to them. And when we're working with kind of like larger companies, we make sure that we get final approval on that before we move forward. And so uh, although, although a lot of times uh, there isn't someone uh, dedicated to being kind of like a, a product manager on their end, uh, we try to get them to sign off on that. Now, a lot of times uh, what we've experienced in the past is that we would do that and then we'd come up with wireframes or even kind of like a prototype and they would be like, you know, this looks completely different. And so in many cases what we do is we assign uh, that company a product manager from our end and that person really kind of you know works with the, the business usually it's a business person on their end or a marketing person and, and works with them very very closely to kind of like educate them on the process and we found that really assigning a product manager to these companies that aren't uh, technical in terms of the software space is really really valuable to, to what we're trying to do and it really smooths out the process so any other questions um yeah so I wonder like what type of tools do you use to manage all the uh, mockups, uh, user flows, and designs, and also the te textual specification, like within your own team, and also, I guess, like within the client and getting comments from the client and so on? Okay, yeah. Um, and so, a lot of times for project management, uh, we use Jira or we use Asana. Uh, we've also used uh, Trello, depending on the different sizes of the teams that I've worked with in, in, in the past, over the past few years. Uh, so for project management, Jira has, has been great. It's a little bit bloated uh, as a software, but it really allows kind of like larger teams focus on, on uh, very specific elements and issues. Uh, from a wireframing perspective, uh, I use uh, Illustrator. Uh, I'm very comfortable with Illustrator, and it helps the process go by really fast. But a lot of times I work with developers that are using uh, either OmniGraffle for uh, wireframes or UI flows, uh, and also Balsamic. Uh, but again, I, I always prefer uh, Illustrator. Um, and then once it gets to kind of like the high fidelity mockups, uh, I work again in either Illustrator or, or Photoshop, depending on the need. 
Uh, and this is where it's kind of tricky in terms of you know, passing your work off to another designer, because a lot of times you just want to iterate the designs as, as fast as possible, so you don't have time to kind of like stop and name the layers or name the folders and things like that. And it's really important to do that, because if you ever had to leave the project as a designer, or there was a, you know, a development team that lost their designer, if, excuse me, if they had these organized files to hand over to the new designer, it makes things a lot easier. Um, and in terms of uh, prototyping, a lot of times uh, we, for iOS applications, we work with uh, storyboarding. Um, and uh, for Android applications, uh, we just uh, um, we we just create the sto uh, the storyboard or the prototype from scratch. So. I think there is one more question yeah. here. So I just wanted to ask, from the designer perspective, um, how soon do you include developers in the process of yeah. documenting and planning everything? And do you experience to have conflicts between designers and developers? Yeah. Um, so uh, there are oftentimes conflicts between developers and designers. Um, and the developer-designer relationship is, is a very interesting one. And kind of so leading to that first part of your question, um, it's best to have developers uh, uh, involved in the process uh, at the start, uh, but also kind of you know, include the designers in, in that initial phase too. And so what we're starting to see is that there's a balance between how much technical experience is important for the designer to know, because they, in many ways, can think, okay, the features and functionality will be limited for you know, the, the development team up to a certain extent, but I think it's very important to have designers that maybe don't know, you know, the the very technical details, because that'll just limit their kind of like creativity in, in terms of thinking. You know, this is the better option to, in terms of usability, because we, ha you know, but it takes a custom view and it might take you know twice as many hours. And so if they think like that, then they're going to kind of like limit the software from their perspective. And it's it's really always a, a battle between the designers and engineers to say like, okay, well this is the option we have. It takes this many hours. This is the option you want as a designer, and it takes you know four times as many hours. Do we really need it? And so those discussions are are, are really uh, based on kind of like how much time and the scope of the project. I feel. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>